Hey, welcome back to Big Al Books. I know it's been a few months since I've posted any videos on my channel, but I'm hoping that you can find it in your heart to forgive me because 2020 has just been a tough year for many people across the globe. And I had been doing a pretty good job of getting through 2020 unscathed until high schools opened back up in September. I'm a teacher and pretty much everything about education has been changing in the past few weeks. So my work-life balance has not been ideal, hence I haven't really been able to sit down and film videos or read as much as I would like to be able to. However, I am starting to get used to the new routine. I'm getting my energy back and I'm ready to return back to YouTube. And I wanted to catch you up on some of the books that I've been reading since we've spoken last. Since we've got four months to catch up on, I thought I'd split this video into two parts. So in today's part, we'll talk about some of the stuff that I was reading in the summer. And then in part two, I can tell you about some of my reading adventures from September and October. So let's start things off by going back in time to July and August. My first reading project of the summer was to read some South American literature, which I already made a wrap-up video about back in July. My second project was to finish off reading all of the plays by William Shakespeare. My third project was to participate in the Women in Translation Month in August. And my fourth project was to read as many books as I could by Canadian authors throughout the entire summer. So let's start off with the good old pile of Shakespeare. This was kind of my lockdown project. I thought now would be the perfect opportunity to finally get through all of those unread Shakespearean plays that I had sitting around. And I was successful this summer. I have now read all 37 of the plays. The ones that I had left to read in the summer were definitely not his strongest ones. I can't say that I found many new favorites and there were a few of them that I didn't really care for. I would say my least favorite one was definitely Henry VIII because I feel like Henry VIII is a fascinating historical figure but this play was so boring so I don't really know how Shakespeare achieved that. I also didn't really love King John and Two Gentlemen of Verona was definitely my least favorite of the comedies that I read this summer. This one annoyed me to no end. On a more positive note, there were three plays that stood out to me in a good way. One of them was As You Like It. I feel like this one was just very different than Shakespeare's other comedies and I liked watching the mischief go down in the woods. I also quite enjoyed Love's Labor's Lost. I think it helped that I watched a film production of this. It just helped me connect with it on a deeper level. What really won me over about this play though was the ending because usually at the end of a Shakespearean comedy you think that the mix-ups will be resolved, the couples will get together, and you're gonna end it in a nice wedding party. And the ending of this play was so much more somber and open-ended than I was expecting and I really enjoyed that. And then my favorite of the plays I read this summer was Troilus and Cressida, mostly because this play was not at all what I was expecting. I was kind of thinking that this was going to be like a Romeo and Juliet-esque kind of tragic love story about two people who are in love with someone who's on the opposite side of the Trojan War. I thought this was going to be very serious in the classical kind of vein, and this play just ended up being way more sarcastic and cynical than I was expecting. It ended up kind of ripping apart Homer and the classical tradition, so I did not go into this one expecting a roast, so I kind of liked the surprise factor with this play. In order to fully complete my Shakespeare project, I also read his sonnets and his narrative poems. These were all right, but I definitely prefer Shakespeare as a playwright. However, one collection that I really enjoyed even more than Shakespeare's own poetry was this contemporary poetry collection called Sonnets Shakespeare by Sonnet LeBay. This collection is an extreme example of how to talk back to the canon. So Sonnet took all of Shakespeare's original sonnets, she leaves them on the page here, but then she kind of transposes her own ideas on top of the original sonnet. So the original sonnet is always there on the page, but she has inserted material from her own life and her own identity and has kind of rewritten this classic. So I loved that she was able to reflect on what it's like to be a person of color living in Canada. She worries about the effects of colonization. She wonders about environmental destruction and what our future is going to look like. But even though some of these topics are pretty heavy, she also has a lot that are just really fun and flippant. Like one of the poems in here was about Jose Batista's bat flip with the Toronto Blue Jays. There's another one in here about Pokemon. So you just never really knew what topic she was going to take on in this. And I thought this was just such a fun way of talking back to the classics and imposing her own modern take on this classic text. 
I guess while we're still on the topic of Shakespeare, I should mention I read another installment in the Hogarth Shakespeare series, and that was Vinegar Girl by Anne Tyler. And this one is taking on The Taming of the Shrew, which is such a fascinating and problematic play. I feel like a contemporary novelist could really have a lot of fun picking apart all of the complexities apparent in this play. But Anne Tyler doesn't do any of that. Rather, she goes for such a simple and straightforward retelling. There are really no surprises in the way that she treats this story. Also, her characters were just deeply irritating and the dialogue was very cringy and flat. So unfortunately, this was a really bad introduction to quite a well-loved author and one of my most disappointing and annoying reads of the summer. And while we're still on the topic of dead authors like Shakespeare, let's talk about my five favorite classics of the summer. Three of them are French classics and two of them are very chunky French classic novels from the 1800s that I loved both of them so much. In fact, I'm not going to talk about them too much in this video because I'm pretty sure both of them will be appearing again on my favorite books of the year video which will be happening in a few weeks. So these two books were The Hunchback of Notre Dame by Victor Hugo and The Red and the Black by Stendhal. Both of these were brilliant books. You know, they were both such fun, gripping, page-turning stories. Like, so much drama goes down in both of these books. Yet I also feel like both of these books were very masterful examinations of French history, culture, and social issues. So even though The Hunchback of Notre Dame is set in more of a medieval era, and The Red and the Black is set in more of like a post-Napoleonic era. I felt like both of these books taught me so much about France. The Red and the Black is about a sensitive peasant named Julian who longs to rise up in the world. He wants to rise in his class and his station, and it's all about him social climbing, making connections, and also disastrous love decisions. Whereas The Hunchback of Notre Dame is more of a social novel. It's got a wide cast of characters, people who are involved with this famous cathedral in Paris. A lot of outsiders of society people who don't fit in and form these very complex and dramatic relationships with one another. And yes, this was nothing like the Disney movie. So reading this book for the first time had a lot of surprises and twists and turns, which I absolutely loved. The other French classic that I read is a lot slimmer, and that is The Stranger by Albert Camus. And I have good memories of reading this one because I took it with me to read at the beach one day. And I know normally people might want to try to find fun, fluffy page turners to bring with them to the beach, not a existentialist nightmares where a man commits murder for like no reason and then has to deal with the fallouts of that. So this was definitely a dark and depressing one to read at the beach. But I also feel like being out in the heat of the sun really brought me into the madness of this story. So it did help me connect with the atmosphere. So I have some good memories of flipping through this one uh, in the summer days. I also love reading Thomas Hardy during the summer, and I got around to reading A Laodicean. Not one of his most well-known books, but it is quite Hardy-esque in structure since it is based on a love triangle where this young lady has two different suitors, and they both have kind of different reasons for wanting to pursue her. My favorite thing about this book, though, was this side character called Mr. Dare, whose purpose in the book was basically to, like, scheme and interfere in these romantic relationships, and he was just such a creepy and weird character and he really redeemed this book from just being a simple straightforward love triangle narrative. And my last classic is a nonfiction classic, and that is Walden by Henry David Thoreau. I know a lot of people like to roast Thoreau. People have some pretty strong opinions on him, but I have to say I really enjoyed this text because really there's something beautiful about examining what it's like to live intentionally out in the world. So I found that this book was really able to make me reflect a lot on my own life. I also would only read this book when I was outside, out and about, kind of wandering around in the park where I live. So I have such great memories of taking this out with me in the summer and reflecting on life and enjoying Thoreau's hot take opinions on what it means to live a good life. Next, I have five highlights of books that I read for Women in Translation Month in August. My favorite of these books was Flights by Olga Tokarczuk, translated from the Polish by Jennifer Croft. And this is now my second book by this author, and she's just always so delightful. I always have such a fun time when I'm reading her books. She has a really unique way of writing and this really fun way of seeing the world. And Flights was kind of a bittersweet read in 2020 because this is a book that is kind of an ode to travel and living 
life in the in-between areas. People who are always on the move, always in transit, kind of the fun, fulfilling motion of life. And it was kind of sad to read that in a summer where I was not able to travel anywhere or really go anywhere or do anything all that fun. So I guess I kind of lived vicariously through the adventures of the characters in the story, but I still found it to be just a really joyful, fun read. Next up, I have a much darker and bleaker book, which is Hurricane Season by Fernanda Melchor. This is a Mexican novel that is a really gripping atmospheric read, but it's intensely dark and violent. So it was one that really sucked me in and pulled me into this world, but it was also a really unpleasant world to be in. But it was such a memorable read because I just felt so strongly taken in to the world described in Hurricane Season. And then I also have another kind of moody read, and that was Will and Testament by Vigdis Hirth, who's a Norwegian author. This was translated by Charlotte Barsland, and this is just one of those good, juicy Scandinavian family dramas. You've got a family where the parents own two summer cabins, and they've decided to drop two of their children out of their inheritance, so these two will not be able to have access to these cabins in the future, and it's kind of about all of the fallout that happens in the family after that. The two siblings who are still included in the family and the two who are excluded. And I loved how this book explored how all of these children grew up in the same family, but they had very different understandings of their parents, very different memories, and it can be really hard to reconcile your truth with someone else's. And this book did a very powerful job of exploring that. Another highlight was Kemogoska by Anne Hébert. This was translated by Norman Shapiro, and this is a French-Canadian classic from the 1960s. And essentially, this one is kind of like the tenant of Wildfell Hall set in rural Quebec. So it is this woman looking back on her life. She gets involved in this unhappy marriage, but then she falls in love with the country doctor and gets in a certain affair and that leads to certain violent events occurring. So this one kind of had a juicy dramatic plot that was going on, but also it was very much about her thinking back on this time of her life. So it was also kind of exploring memory and the way that we tell our stories about who we are. So that was a pretty intense one. I also really enjoyed a poetry collection that I read. This is the Selected Works by Sor Juana Inés de la Cruz, and this was translated by Edith Grossman, who is one of my all-time favorite translators. And I wish that people in the English-speaking world knew more about this lady. She was a poet living in Mexico in the 1600s, and I feel like we just don't get to read enough female poets from that era. So not only is she cool historically, but her poems were actually really great. My only problem with this collection is that I actually wanted more poetry. I feel like we only got a small sampling of what she had to offer as the second half of this collection is more some of her like religious plays and a kind of feminist letter that she wrote back in the day. So I would love to continue reading more of this author in the future. I thought her poems were very intellectually complex but also quite beautiful and fun to read. And then the last category of books that I read this summer were books by Canadian authors and I have a few highlights that I want to quickly talk about. Um, my favorite new release that I read this summer was New Pimming, The Cure for White Ladies by Leanne Batessa Masake Simpson. She is a Michi Sagik Nishinaabeg author and just one of my favorite writers working today. This is her first take on the novel and you can probably see from the structure that it's a little unconventional, which made it such an intriguing read. This novel is exploring colonization in Canada and what it's like to live in occupied cities like Toronto or other parts of Ontario but it's also presenting a decolonized vision of the future, especially through the way that these characters are able to build connection with each other, with the land in a colonial present, and also with the other beings around in the environment, such as the animals. Some of my favorite characters in here were the raccoon people and the geese people. So this novel had some really complex characters, and I loved the way that it presented relationship building and maintaining. I also liked how each of the narrators represented a different part of the body, mind, or spirit. So this is a really intense, philosophical novel and it definitely is going to take a few read-throughs to try to get what's going on in here but I had a brilliant time reading this book this summer and I'd highly recommend it. 
I also had a lot of fun reading The Rage of Dragons by Evan Winter. This is actually the second book in the series. The first book is down in my basement and I didn't feel like going to get it. <laughs> and the second one just came out recently and I'm so excited to read it. This is a really fun, fast-paced, African-inspired fantasy series that is also taking on a world that has been torn apart by colonization. In this book, we're actually following the story through the lens of the colonial occupiers. They're a society that is always perpetually at war with the indigenous people of the land where they're in and basically the people in the society grow up and have to join the military because they're just always fighting and we're exploring the story through the lens of a young man named Tao. I'm not gonna spoil what happens to him but essentially he's kind of radicalized on a quest of revenge after something serious happens to him and we're kind of following his journey as he trains as a fighter and gets involved in some serious stuff going down. I was really impressed with how quickly the plot moves and there's also so much that happens in just the first book of the series. So I'm very excited to continue forward with this very soon uh, with reading book two. And then I also have two books that are kind of more of like an interconnected short story experience. Um, the first one of these is called The Dodecahedron or Frame for Frames by Paul Glennon. And he was inspired by the shape of the dodecahedron where you kind of have these 12 different sides. He's got 12 stories and all of them need to have certain things in connection with the stories that come before and after. So I sort of liked how reading this was kind of a shifting kaleidoscopic experience because what you'd learn in one story would then be contradicted or contrasted in the story that would go after and you could kind of read these in a different order and your meaning of what would happen would change so I kind of liked that experimental bent also these stories were just really fun and adventurous and were very entertaining I also quite enjoyed Frying Plantain by Zalika Reed Benta. This is an interconnected group of short stories about a girl who is growing up in the little Jamaica neighborhood in Toronto. And these stories are following her as she grows up and has to kind of come to terms with her identity because she has certain expectations placed upon her by her mother and her grandparents who are Jamaican immigrants. And then she also has the friends that she's meeting at school in Canada who have different expectations for her. So I thought this book did a great job of developing the tensions of identity and relationship that can be at play in the immigrant experience. And then I have four nonfiction books that I have to mention. I was looking to learn more about the topic of anti-Black racism in Canada, and these four books all had a lot to teach me. One that I really enjoyed was a collection of essays called Black Writers Matter, which was edited by Whitney French, and I really loved the variety because what I think it's important to remember is that every person has their own individual experience, and you kind of can't generalize saying this is what it's like to be Black in Canada, right? So each of the authors in this essay collection had their own story to tell. It was interesting to see what kind of similarities were coming up in these essays, such as people always asking the authors, where are you really from? Kind of implying that they can never inherently be Canadians. But I also liked that Whitney French tried to choose authors from a really diverse variety of backgrounds and lived experiences. So some of these essays were written by academics and one of them was written by a man who drives taxis around the city. So I really liked that she tried to include a wide plurality of experiences. I also learned a lot reading Black Like Who by Ronaldo Walcott. I was nervous going into this one because it is from the 90s and this is a 20th anniversary edition. So I was worried that I wouldn't know any of the books or the films or the music that he was writing about and I didn't really, but it didn't matter because so much of what he was writing about is still relevant today. Now he has a very complex theoretical academic style of writing that was kind of difficult, but these essays were very mind bending and I learned a lot about what makes the Canadian experience of blackness very different than it might be in America. I also learned a lot about slavery in Canada from reading The Hanging of Angelique by Afua Cooper. This is based on the true story of a woman who was accused for setting fire to a house in Old Montreal and she was convicted and then killed because of this. And this is kind of getting into her story, but particularly I liked the first half of this book that was getting into kind of the larger story of slavery in Canada, where had she come from, and what was life like for people living in slavery in Canada, because that is something that is not discussed much here, and I learned a lot. 
while reading this book. I also quite enjoyed The Skin We're In, A Year of Black Resistance and Power by Desmond Cole. This is a work of journalism that's exploring the year 2017. It kind of goes month by month and brings up certain current issues and events that were happening in the news. And since I myself have lived in Canada in that year, a lot of these stories were kind of familiar to me, but I kind of knew them from how the media had been portraying them. And I feel like Desmond Cole did a great job of showing what was actually going on behind the scenes. So I got a lot more context for these stories. And sadly, some of the cases and stories that he's talking about were still continuing to make news in 2020. So I still found it was a really relevant book to be reading. I also found his writing style to be quite engaging and accessible. So if you're looking to learn more about some issues involving oppression and inequity in Canada, this would be a good starting place. I also have three miscellaneous memoirs slash essay collections that I read this summer that I wanted to mention. One of them was Wow No Thank You, Essays by Samantha Irby. This is the third essay collection by her that I've read and I enjoy all of them. I think she has such a funny style of writing and like reflecting back on her life and how ridiculous it is. It's kind of funny watching her get older. She's like living in the suburbs now so she's trying to like get used to life living with a family. She's making a steadier income but she is still kind of a person that's getting into a lot of messes so she's still very much a fun person to read about. On a more serious note, I read I Will Never See the World Again, the memoir of an imprisoned writer by Ahmet Altan. You can kind of guess what this one is about based on the title, but these are essays about the experience of what it's like to be taken away from your home abruptly, sent to prison, going through a kind of bogus trial, and finding out that you're going to be spending the rest of your life away from your family and the people that you love in captivity, and how he's able to bounce back from that through through his love of reading and writing. So these were really inspiring essays in many ways because he feels that as a writer and as a reader with a strong imagination, no one can really truly take all of his freedom away. So even though he is locked up from the physical environment, he still has a lot of feelings and thoughts that people can't take away from him. So that was a really powerful reading experience. And then another memoir that I really loved was one called Tomboy Survival Guide by Ivan Coyote. This is by a non-binary author who was growing up in the Yukon, which is a part of Canada that I never get to read enough about. And it's about growing up as someone who is gender non-conforming and what they've gone through in their life from their career in the trades to becoming a writer and a storyteller and speaking at schools. These stories were really warm and accessible. There's just something really inviting about the way that Ivan Coyote tells their stories and I was someone who grew up as a pretty extreme tomboy myself so I found myself really connecting with these stories and it really made me think about my identity and my place in the world while also getting to learn more about someone else's story so that's a pretty cool experience when that happens and if you are looking to learn a little bit more about what it's like to be gender non-conforming or non-binary I think this is a wonderful story collection to start out with. So I'm gonna stop it there for today's video. Those were some of my favorite books that I read in the summer. And then you can join me again in part two, where I will talk about some of my favorite reads from September and October. Thank you so much for returning to my channel and checking in on me and seeing how I'm doing. I would love to know how you are doing. Uh, please let me know how you've been throughout the past few months and hopefully I'll see you again in part two. Bye.